all searching for that better life. And it's sometimes, though, we look for it in the wrong places, and that's the whole idea. We have this issue going on, and, and we're in week three of our series, Searching for a Better Life, because so often we look for something that we already have. And, and the reason that we have people come to church, honestly, and the reason probably you originally went to church, or uh, other than maybe you grew up, or your parents, or whoever first went in your family that brought your family to church, was because they were searching for something better, better than anything the world has to offer. And, and that's one of the problems today. But so many people walk away from church and Christianity and religion today because that's all it is. It's, it's taken a form of religious activity. And the reason why people walking away from church is because it's not the life they thought it would be. It's not the life they wanted. And sometimes what we want is harder. And, and as you have your Bibles today, we're going to be back in Ephesians chapter 5 this time. And it's important to see the truth that Paul is saying. By the way, it's always good if you carry your Bible, it's good. I know we put the verses on screen, but we don't do that so you don't have to carry a Bible. We do that to help you if you've got a different version or whatever, so you can follow along with what I'm thinking here, just to make sure you're, you're keeping step. But um, always be a good student of God's Word and keep a copy of God's Word with you. That's always important. How can you give an answer of the hope that lies within you if you don't have that Word with you? And so that's a good thing to keep with you. So... We're talking today in Ephesians chapter 5, and, and before I get into the text or anything else, I want to give you a, a context of what's going on here, because there's a lot of verses, and we're not going to cover them all, um, but the context of Ephesians chapter 5 is that the world we live in is not friendly, it's not kindly, it's not friendly to spiritual growth, and that's pretty obvious here. In fact, if you were to go through, and there again, we're not going to get into our text yet, but to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, Paul uses terms like he says the world is dark in, in, in verse number 8. He tells us that, uh, that the world, and in, in, in you have to read what he's saying here, but in verse number uh, 14, he talks about the world is a grave. In verse number 16, he talks about our time period, the age of the world, this age that we live in is evil. And, and, and <clears throat> because of this, he wants to give us a number of commands that, that we need to follow. But you have to realize the world we live in is not friendly to spiritual growth. And that's the, the importance of what he's trying to get us across to us. See, there's a number of commands that tell us to fight against the current, uh, to struggle, to do things that, to be honest with you, they feel unnatural because we've been more acclimated to the life that we used to live. That counterculture of Christ is just hard sometimes to do, and it makes it feel awkward, especially when we have a lot of friends that are still doing those things. And, and, and what Paul is painting is this picture that if you just keep coasting, if you sort of just drift in this sea of culture today, the sea of the, the world system, you'll eventually drown. And that's what Paul would have us to understand. And he wants us to understand that in the middle of this dark world that we're supposed to live, as he says in verse number 8, live as children of the light. And, and we're supposed to find out what pleases God, and that's what he says in verse 10. But the image that he's trying to get to as we, we, we're looking at before we get to our text, he's trying to help us understand it's the image of darkness. And, and I, I don't know how many times you've ever been in a place that's truly dark, but I hate stubbing my toes. I have real sensitive feet sometimes. Sometimes I can't feel them at all, but a lot of times they're, just, they're sensitive to pain. They aren't sensitive to anything else. And I'm just be honest with you, sometimes I stand there and, and in the dark and I'm moving and just you stub your toe on something. Or the other day I cut my foot. And I, I hate to do this to you. I don't know. I'm that person when I hear somebody else talk about their foot. Like, I have nerves that sort of tingle and they hurt just talking about it. So if you're one of those people, I apologize because I hate when people do that to me. But that's how it is. And what Paul has given us is this picture is that the world we live in, this dark world that's death, that's dead, that's asleep, it's this image of trying to read in the dark. <laughs> I, if, if we didn't have windows and all that, I'd turn out the lights and, and, and let you try and read something in the dark. But obviously it's not going to work in here. But have you ever tried to read in the dark? It's crazy hard, isn't it? It's so hard, um, and, and you've really got to focus, and what we really have to see is the only place you can actually read anything, the only place you can see anything is where you focus the light, and that's what Paul's trying to help us understand here. So we pick up our text, and we're going to read verses 14 through 17, uh, the first half of our text, and just get an idea of what Paul's saying here. So read with me. If you have your Bible, you can read it in your Bible, but if not, it's on screen. 
This is why it is said, and, and get the, the, what he's talking about here in verse 14. What, this is what it is said. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. He's talking about that grave. That's the world we live in. He's saying, get out of the funk that you're in. You, you grew up and you've been uh, Gentiles who came from the flesh, and it's a dead zone. He says, Christ will shine on you. Remember where you focus the light is where you'll be able to see. That's what he's getting that point across. Verse 15, he's on. He says, be very careful. Be very careful then. Because, do you get the idea here? He's saying, because of the darkness, because of his attitude of death, because of all the things that are going against you, be very careful then how you live. Well, that's good advice. In some of the translations, they use the term walk. In the Bible, you'll find the word walk so often uh, is, is the word how it's translated, but it actually means to live. It actually means that. Uh, in fact, uh, we even had it in our, our Old Testament text this morning as we, we looked at it in Genesis chapter 17 in, in our adult Bible study. Um, it's how you live. And he says, be very careful. This is a problem. He's, he's noting this problem. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Don't be stupid is how we'd say it. Marking the most of every, uh, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Once again, was he telling us? This is not something that's going to be easy to do spiritually to walk in and to grow in this. He keeps going. He says in verse 17, he says, therefore, therefore, don't be foolish. Now, he's already told us not to be unwise because obviously he thinks that we'll have that propensity to do that. And then he says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understand what the Lord's will is. And what he's trying to get us to understand is how bad things are. And Paul's not a doomsday. I don't want to be a doomsday prophet here. But it's something I think we always note. But we don't note it in the right way. But Paul's saying, hey, the culture you live in, the world you live in, and if this is true in the first century, do you think it's true in the 21st century? Absolutely. He's saying, hey, listen here. There is a culture that is not going to be good for you to live in. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a problem. And you know what I realize? So many people come to church to think, hey, I'm going to get out of my problems. I'm going to get out of jail free, right? I'm going to get out of everything. It's a get out of all problems in my life. And so people come and they have marriages that are falling apart. They have relationships that are falling apart. They have jobs that are, are falling apart or they lost their job. They have families that are, are, are tanking. And you know what they do? Well, I, can't, I went to church. I went to church. And you know what Paul would say? Don't be silly. He'd say it probably even meaner than I'm saying it, but he'd say, don't be silly. Isn't that what he said twice? Don't be, be wise. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. But understand something. Understand the world you live in is dark. It's evil. There are everything's against you, and if you keep drifting, you are not going to win. I hate losing, don't you? I, evidently not, so. <laughs> I hate losing, don't you? Yeah. I hate losing. I mean, it's... Why, why do we play to have fun? Are you one of those people? We just play to have fun. I'm not. I'm not. I play to win. Because you know what's fun? Winning, isn't it? And life is not a game, but I want you to know this. What Paul is saying here is you will lose if you play by the rules of this world. And that's what we have to understand because the tempo and rhythm of the world the, the, the tempo and rhythms of the world are not in line with the purposes of God. <laughs> and we are dancing to the wrong tunes, guys. We are. The tempo and rhythms of the world are not in line with God's purposes, God's plans. And that's what Paul wants us to clearly understand here. And he's saying, hey, if you think you can exist in this world and just everything's going to come up roses, you're stupid. You're foolish. I know, you're not supposed to use the S word. You're silly, I'll say it that way. And he wants it to be offensive because he's trying to make a point because he's not dancing around here with something that's, uh, uh, well, don't worry about it. You can cross the line. The problem is, he's saying there's a whole different function in our lives. The tempo and rhythms of the world are not in line with God's purposes because the world has different values. Don't you realize that? I mean, look at the values of culture today. I, it's almost like I, I, I felt like this, and I've, you probably heard me say this multiple times, but is this the same world I grew up in? Because things are way different. And I'm not just talking about they've moved forward. I'm just talking they moved forward and they moved to the left. 
Haven't they? They've been way to the left. And things are way out of line with God's purposes. And yet we sit back and say, the good old days, good old days. And you know what Paul would say? Hey, silly, there were no good old days. Because the culture of the world in the first century was still bad. And what we're trying to do is dance to the tempo and rhythm of the world, and you can't line those up with God's purposes, God's plan. It doesn't work. And that's where we come disillusioned and say, I thought church would be different. I thought Christianity would help me. I thought it would make everything go together. And you know what? There's this conflict that we're always going to have because the, the, the values of the world are different. The agendas of the world are different, aren't they? They have a different purpose for what they're trying to get to than what God has to. They have a different priority. They have a different desire. And in those things, if the rhythms of your life, if the rhythms of your life, and life is full of those rhythms, aren't they? The ups and downs, it becomes a rhythm. If the rhythms of your life are set by the world that you live in, then you're going to lose. You're going to fail. And that's why so many people see that. And they see that the rhythms, and it doesn't work. And they walk away looking for something better, better life. See, what most people don't realize, we've heard this before, and we know this to be true, but the ultimate truth, the Christian life Paul would tell you this, first-hand knowledge. He'd tell you the Christian life is a struggle. The Christian life is a struggle. Somewhere we lied to people and told them it's, it's easy. It's fun. It's great. And you know what Paul would say? It is if you like getting stoned. If you like getting shipwrecked, beaten, whipped, alienated from people, have people say bad things about you, malign you. Hey, it is. If you think that's fun, but it's not easy. It's a struggle. And that's what Paul wants us to understand. In fact, it's not just Paul, but you go through the New Testament authors, and you know what they all tell you? <laughs> it's not easy. It's going to be full of problems and persecutions and pain. In fact, Jesus, according to Paul, Jesus says he invites us into the fellowship of his sufferings. Welcome to Christianity. And we're all disappointed because we thought it was going to be a bunch of blessings and, and rewards. And we, they're against because our idea of blessings are different than God's. And that's the struggle we have. And because of that, I've watched countless people walk away. Walk away when God didn't give them their heart's desires. Because their heart's desires were lined up to the rhythm and tempos of the world. And that's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's saying when he talks about guys like Demas, and he says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. He's saying, Demas is dancing to a different tune, different rhythm. And if you do those kind of things, you're going to fail. You're going to walk away from God. And if you ever wondered why so many people today are walking away, you know why? Because they're more enthralled with the reasons, the rhythms, the tempo, the desires, the plans, the arguments of the world. And when we put the tempo and rhythms of the world to the pace of God, it just doesn't work out. It doesn't. And that's what Paul wants us to understand here. See, here's what you have to realize today. If we're going to make it in our Christian life, if we're going to make it in our Christian life, we have to declare war. We have to declare war on the pull of the world on us. A world that's sleeping, according to Paul. A world that's dark. A world that's in the grave. In fact, back in chapter 2, and I know we didn't, we didn't pick up in chapter 2, but in chapter 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul talked about the ways of this world. He uses that term. And, and, and that, of course, those ways are completely anti-God. It, it, in those ways, John would tell us this in his writings. John would say it prioritizes three things. The lust of the flesh, bodily pleasures. The lust of the eyes, that is materialism, and the pride of life where it says that I'm more important, I'm greater than God. So my desires, my things are important first. Not only that, but our own flesh is saturated with all these things. So we're not just fighting the world, but we're fighting our own flesh. And that's why Paul says it's a struggle. And Paul tells us that the spirit of the world is at work in our flesh. And we gravitate toward those things. And that becomes a problem. So we have to declare war. Because if you're not fighting, if you're not fighting, then you're losing. That's why. And so many times I look at Christian lives and I go, that guy over there, that, that, that family over there, they're losing so bad because they're not fighting. 
They're not fighting. And if you say, well, I don't like to fight. Hey, you know what? Paul used that term so many times as he told us to be good soldiers of Christ. He said to put, in fact, in, in the next chapter, he's going to tell us to put on the armor of God. And he's wanting us to understand it is a fight we're in. And if you're not fighting, then you're losing. Because you cannot coast to spiritual victory. <laughs> you cannot coast. I watched, I watched this video a long time ago, this guy who was in, uh, in a, a race, um, uh, one of these bicycle races. And he was racing, and it was a mountain stretch, and he was doing phenomenal. Uh, just amazing how good he was doing. He had so far lead that towards the end, when it got down to the flat and he could see the finish line, he sort of... <coughs> took it in, let the crowd see him, took his hands off the, 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 the what do you call it, the steering wheel, I don't know what you call it. And he was, he was sort of coasting, letting his legs rest, because he had really pumped hard going up and down those mountains. It was just hard on him. And the, the guys, the announcers kept saying, boy, he's taking it really easy. I think he thinks he's way out in front of everybody. But he didn't know the next guy was closing in, and that guy was pedaling hard pedaling like he wanted to do it. And you know what's tragic? Is just before the guy crossed the finish line, the other man came zooming in in front of him. And he lost the race. And I, I think that's the picture we have to understand. If you're not fighting, if you're not pedaling, you're losing. And, and the author of Hebrews would tell you there's a dangerous, deadly drift out there. And when we drift along in our lives, when we drift along in religion, then we will lose everything that we have been given. And that's what he wants us to do. You don't coast yourself to spiritual victory. If you don't have a plan, then you're going to lose. If you don't set priorities, you don't choose the relationships, if you don't grow intentionally with God, then you're already lost. You're probably dead and spiritually. See, we're either killing sin or being killed by sin. That's what Paul would want us to understand. And there's no in-between. There's no, hey, I'm taking the happy medium. You can't ride the fence on this one. We're either killing the sin in our life or the sin in our life is killing us. And that's what Paul is really warning us. So I said all that really to get to this point. How do we engage in warfare? Since I told you it's a battle, we need to fight. Well, I'm glad you asked. First thing Paul tells us here is that we need to complete uh, we need to contemplate your moves. Contemplate your moves. I, I think about <laughs> strategies. As a coach, I coached for years. Um, 20, 20, almost 30 years I coached, and I was pretty successful in, in coaching. And one of the things I realized is you have to realize your moves way in advance. You script out games. Football coach, you're going to put down what you're going to do ahead of time, and you're going to say, well, we're in this situation, we're going to do that. And you script out. You've got to contemplate what the other team's going to do. The Art of War by Sun Tzu, he says, you win half the battles that you know yourself and your army. You'll win half those battles if you know yourself and you know your army. He says, you'll win half the battles if you know your enemy and his army. But he says, you'll win every battle if you know yourself and your enemy. And I think he's right. We need to contemplate our moves. I, I, I remember growing up as a, as a little kid, my, my older brother, he was always so good at chess. We'd sit down. He tried to. He didn't have a lot of patience with me. I was the younger, younger brother. And he would sit down with his chessboard, and he's playing, and he'd try and teach me some things. And he would just get so frustrated because I would take a simple move thinking it's the, the first thing I should do. And he's already thought five moves down the road. He could beat me in two moves, three moves. He had me at checkmate every time. I just I hated him sometimes. I really did. Um, it, just, it, it made me mad. It really would because I like to win. But Paul here is saying, hey, you know what? That's just a game. Life is not a game. Contemplate your moves. In fact, you go back to verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, he says, look at what he says here. Be very careful. Be very careful. And he's not just being, be careful what you're carrying, be careful with. No, he's saying, be careful then how you live. He says, contemplate your moves. Think about where you're heading in our direction. And I think sometimes we're just like, I'm just going to see what happens. Let's see. Hey, you know what? <laughs> My wife and I, we love to go to water parks with our kids when our kids were younger. We, down in Florida, you know, there's a ton of these uh, water, water parks. <laughs> and uh, we tried, I think we tried all of them down there. And um, there was one of the water parks down in Florida, um, the Disney water park, Typhoon Lagoon. 
it actually has a water roller coaster. And it's pretty cool. If you've never been on a water roller coaster, they actually put you in this uh, floatable thing, and it shoots you out, just like a roller coaster, and you go up and down hills, and it's, it's intense. It is. Um, but they also have what they call the lazy river, which is not intense. <laughs> and, and I like both. I like to enjoy it. As the older I got, the more I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. Um, my wife was like, when are we going? She, her first question, as soon as we got to the park, is like, when are we going to the Lazy River? When are we going to the Lazy River? Because she liked the fact you can just get on, a, get on a tube, lay on that thing, and it would just take you around and around. You could stay on that thing all day. Didn't have to do anything. Just enough current. It wasn't going to, you weren't, you weren't worried about anything. Just carried you around, carried you around. And I think what Paul's saying here is, hey, there is no lazy river in life. Life will knock you down, take you out. It'll, it's, it's like the big wave pool. <laughs> I remember we went to the big wave pool. I love those things too. And you get in there and they're, they're overcrowded with people, which that's, that's the irritating thing. And what you better know is how to swim. Because <laughs> if you get out in that wave pool far enough and they start generating those waves that come one after another after another, well, those lifeguards that are standing around are going to end up coming in to get you because they know you're not going to make it. You're going to drown. And it's hard because you keep getting beaten back and beaten back by the water. And you know what Paul's saying here? Be careful how you live. He says you better contemplate your moves. You better think about where you're headed. He says be wise in your moves. Back in verse number 10, he says this. He says, find out what pleases the Lord. And that, that term, find out, it really, literally means, in, in the original Greek, it means try to discern what pleases God. And I think about Jesus and his life. In John chapter 8, Jesus is facing his disciples and the, and the Pharisees, and, and he says, for I do always, for I do always those things that please him. That's Jesus' testimony. For I do always those things that please him. And isn't that what we should be doing? We should be finding out what Paul says pleases the Lord. The problem is, the culture says, please yourself. Do it your way. If it feels good, do it. After all, you owe it to yourself. You earned it. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. You better choose the moves that you have. Find out what pleases God. He says in verse number 17, he says, therefore... Do not be foolish. One of those other offensive terms. He says, don't be foolish, but understand. And our lack of understanding about what God's will is. So many times people go, oh, I just don't know what God's will is. Or we talked about this in Sunday school today. <laughs> I got to find God's will. Paul doesn't say, hey, you have to find God's will. He says, understand it. Understand it. It's right here. Take the time to study it. He told his apprentice, Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what he's saying there? Understand the Lord's will for your life. Make sure you contemplate your moves. Walk the right way. Because as the Bible tells us, this walk is how God is going to view our life. And we should be walking with God's eyes on our life, realizing he's viewing everything we do. If God saw everything you did in the day, what would you do differently? That's the question we should be asking. Strive to understand is what he's saying here in verse 17. That understand, strive to understand. You know why? It's not going to come naturally to you. It's not going to, you know what? And that's one of the reasons it's so hard. You know what comes naturally to you? The works of the flesh. Lying, cheating, stealing doing all the abominable things that we hate and we know God hates, that's what comes natural to us. Paul's saying, hey, you've got you to fight. You have to declare war on this. Jesus, back in Matthew, he told the story, the parable of the, the seed and the sowers. And, and we're not going to take time to read it because it's lengthy. But in that story, and here, here's what I want to point out. In that story, Jesus tells us that the seed is the word of God. And obviously God's the sower, and we're the different types of soil, our hearts. And here's what I noticed. When you think about this, the only seed that survives is a seed that's driven deep down into the earth, deep down in the heart. And I think that's what, what Paul's saying here. You have to understand God's will. You have to let it drive deep down into your life. 
You can't, hey, you know what? If all you get this week is this, church for an hour, you're dead. You're floating. You're not going to make it. I'm just telling you, you're weak. You can't make it on this. That's, that's just the truth. You've got to establish what God's will is in your life. See, you need to drive the gospel deep down until you see all your life, that is your successes, your failures, your journeys, your pains, your hopes, your fears. See all those things through the gospel lens. And that's what Paul would say. So contemplate your moves. The second thing Paul would tell us is to be intentional. Be intentional. <laughs> be intentional. If I'm going to contemplate my moves, that's, isn't that intentional? Sometimes, but we're not always intentional about everything we do. He says this in verse 16. If you look at it, he says, making the most of every opportunity. Making the most. That's intentional. You're going to have opportunities. Don't waste them. Don't waste them. As I coach, as I coach basketball, Basketball is my favorite sport. I love football too, but basketball, such a, it, it, the pace of the game can be fast. And I'm telling you, if you haven't taught your guys to be intentional about every opportunity, I remember uh, <clears throat> we were playing in the first time I, I played in the state championship, Florida State Championship. Took my team, and I said, guys, it's great that we made it here. You got a choice, though. This is my pregame. You got a choice. You can coast and act like it's cool to be here and take home the second place trophy, which I always, we told the boys, second place is first loser. <laughs> that's what second place is. Sorry if that offends you, but that's the truth. Second place, first loser. You could do that and sit back and say, hey, I was first loser. Pat yourself on the back that you made it because a lot of teams don't make it this far. That's good. Or you can actually make the most of your opportunity. And you can work and you can fight. And you can take every possession of that ball. And that's what I told him. So we went out and we had yeah, great speech, right? So how'd it go? Uh, first half, we were getting blown out. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting blown out, man. We were getting, I, I, was, I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I came back to halftime, another speech, right? That's what coaches do. Give them a speech. It doesn't make any difference because they're not listening. I said, guys, here's the, here's the deal. Everything I told you, you didn't do. You look at the other team, you said they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. They're more athletic, and they were. Every, I said all those things are true. But none of those things give you a victory. You have to earn it. And you are expecting somebody to come out and say, here, win the game. They want it just as bad as you do. It's the team that's going to work harder for it. And so they said, well, coach, what do we have to do? And I said, you want to know what you have to do? Every possession. Don't think about how far you are down. We were down over 20 points. Every possession. Every possession. Make it count. And I think that's the, the idea that Paul's trying to get us to understand here. Make the most of every possession. You can't take a possession off in basketball. you got to play every time. You gotta make a, 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 a defensive move. You gotta make an offensive move. You gotta do it every time. There's no, hey, rest. <laughs> I remember when my kids were little, uh, Daniel and Rebecca, my wife and, my wife, uh, and I decided they, it would be fun to have them in sports. And so there was recreational um, soccer for the little ones. And I mean, I don't even know how old they were, they were real little. So Rebecca, she's the older one. She was out there, and she's doing her thing. And, you know, hey, and we, had, we got Grandma and Grandpa there and cheering her on and all that. Daniel, though, he gets out there. <laughs> Daniel, this kid, he was worried about what the snacks were on the side. <laughs> so middle of the game, the ball's going around. You know, it's a bunch of little kids, so it's not really organized. And they're just, you know, they didn't practice or anything. They just came out and played game. Um, but it's, it's fun. It's fun. Next thing I know, Daniel's over there talking to my mom and dad, my, their, his grandparents, and talking about drinks and getting something from them to eat. And I, like, Daniel, why are you off the field? You're supposed to be out there. You don't get to stop in the middle. And I think that sometimes is how we play the game of life because we think it's a game and it's not. And Paul's saying, hey, you've got to fight. You've got to fight. Make the most of every opportunity. You've got to plan this thing out. You've got to be intentional. See, if you're going to grow with God, you have to set some priorities. You have to, to learn to develop something. You have to decide to make it a priority with God in your life. Hey, you want your marriages to be good? 
<laughs> they don't just automatically end up good because you came to church. You got to make those a priority too. You got to be intentional about your, your marriage. You want your, hey, you want, you want Maple Springs to be a great church? Great churches aren't made because you came and sat in the pew. Amen, preacher, that was good. It's true, I know. Great churches are made because people got together as the body of Christ, used their spiritual gift, week one of our series, and got into the neighborhoods and told people, told their friends about it, told people about Jesus who makes a difference in their life. That's what we're called. It's intentionality. We are called to be intentional, and he's saying, hey, you know what? I realize it's not easy because the days are evil. You know why we don't want to tell anybody about Jesus? Because we're scared of the culture. We're scared of the world. We're scared of everything around us. I don't want to make them offended. Jesus said, don't be surprised. The world's going to hate you because it hated me. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. We're supposed to make the most of every opportunity. So what opportunities do you have? What opportunities are you going to miss? We're supposed to make the most of it. See, if you don't take control once again, the world will take control. And they will make the most, and they'll direct your course to where you think your recreation, your enjoyment is more important than God's opportunities. If you don't carve out time to grow with God, you won't go with God. And that's the problem. Number three. He says, choose the spirit. He says, choose the spirit, not the spirits. And you'll get what I mean here in a minute. Choose the spirit to deal with life. And it's amazing here when you think about this. When he, when he talks about this, in fact, let's read the verse. In verse number 18, he says this. And understand, please listen carefully to what I'm going to say here. He says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Truth. He just laid that out. But he's not speaking on alcoholism. That's not what his topic is. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And you know what he's, he's addressing here? He's addressing, once again, the topic that I've been talking about, this fighting our lives. And he's saying, you know what? He's acknowledging a problem. In fact, he's helping us understand how we deal with problems. You see, in, in, in our lives, what Paul is telling us, in our lives, there are going to be problems. There are going to be anxieties. There are going to be problems. There are going to be moments that you're going to go, I don't know how to deal with this. And Paul's saying there are basically two ways that people deal with things, two popular ways people deal with things, and they're very similar. He's, he, he acknowledges it, and I would acknowledge this too. And you, you, please listen carefully. Don't take the preacher out of context. He's saying, you know what? There's process number one where we use alcohol or you could actually say alcohol or some other type of self-medication to get through our problems. But probably I would say the number one issue he's saying, at least in his time, was alcohol. He's saying that's one way people do it. He said the other way, which is very similar, similar, but there is a difference. He's saying, hey, you know what? You could also, to deal with the pressures and the disappointments of life, you could also use method number two, and that would be the Holy Spirit. Now, alcohol, drugs, whatever, overeating, all those different things that we're addicted to, they are a lot like the Spirit of God in certain ways. They both produce some of the same things, but, and here's the big but, they do it in entirely different ways, and that's what we have to understand. For instance, alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant that dulls your senses to reality so I don't have to deal with problems, right? And Paul's saying, hey, that's one way of doing it, but it's not the best way because you'll lose that way eventually. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit gives you a way to cope with the problems dealing with the reality of God in your life. And you can always win there. Alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol gets helps you get rid of worry by making you forget. That's one way of dealing with it. It's not the best way, though, Paul says. He says the best way is alcohol. It, 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 it hurts you because it makes you forget, but the Spirit of God will help you remember the promises of God. That'll get you through the issues. See, alcohol, it gives you the courage by making you unaware of the dangers around you. He says, you know what? The Spirit of God gives you courage by showing you that God is greater than your fears. 
Alcohol gives you that cheap thrill. That's why people like it. He says, you know what? That's one way of dealing with life, but you know what? The Holy Spirit adds excitement to your life by reminding you of the overflow of the overflowing promises of God and his goodness to you. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, when Paul talks about this, there's a companion, almost a parallel passage that he says almost exactly the same thing. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read them both. But Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, they're parallel passages. The two are almost identical in what they say, except for the very beginning of them. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, and we've already read it in verse 18, he says, be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians chapter 3, he says, let the message or word of God a word of Christ, dwell among you richly. So what you can gather from that is in Paul's mind, being filled with the Spirit is the same thing as letting the message or the word of Christ dwell among you richly. And that's so important. Because if we flip back to Ephesians chapter 3, the prayer that Paul prays for us as a church, prayed for those Ephesians, in chapter 3 and verse number 18, he says this. He says, I pray that you may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Verse 19, he says, and to know this love that surpasses the knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And what he's saying is, he's saying, when the word of God, when the word of Christ, the spirit dwells in you richly, and you know the depth of the love of Christ and the spirit filling you, you can cope with all the difficulties of, of life. And so that's when Paul says, hey, don't waste your time on alcohol or whatever other things that you get addicted to to help you cope with the problems, the anxieties, the pain of your life. They won't help you. He says, be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Word of Christ because that's the only way you're going to be able to do that. How do we win in this war? He says this, number four, sing that new song constantly in your heart. Sing that new song constantly in your heart. Verse 19, he says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the, from the Spirit, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. What he's trying to get us to understand here is we're trying to remind ourselves constantly of the great work of God on our behalf. He says, you want to win? Rem remember, you've got the strong man in your corner. He tells you, and, and here's what's amazing. When you read this verse, what Paul says here, and, and I, it's perplexing to me because he says, you do this, you remember the things of God, you constantly are, are, are reminding you to, yourself to do these things with music, with song. Now, Paul doesn't say, and this is shocking, because Paul doesn't say, hey, you know what? You need to go out and quote some more scripture. He didn't say that. Paul doesn't go, hey, you know what? Turn on some better sermons and just keep listening to a bunch of sermons. Paul says, music. Music makes the difference. Hymns, songs, to the Spirit, that new song. So let me help you with this, because uh, my question was why, and I wanted to answer it for you. Let me give you a brief, quick theology of music. <sighs> Creation started with a song. The song of God. In fact, if you understood the ancient Hebrew that, was, that Genesis is written in, Genesis chapter 1, it is a poem, which is a song of creation. It is. But that song turns bad. Romans chapter 8, Paul said that all creation, that song that God started off with, groans. Because it's under this curse. And then as we take that song, what we realize is that in the New Testament, the song changes. And becomes new, a new song. That's what we're talking about here. Because salvation is the new song. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 12 Jesus describes, the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus describes salvation as this new song that, is, that he has put in the hearts of God's people. And then Paul comes along and says, we're supposed to sing and make music in our heart, from your heart to the Lord. What he's saying is this is how you change your life. In your heart, the beauty of God is supposed to have the rhythm and tempo, not the world. You're not supposed to be singing the tunes of the world. Find the tunes of the Spirit of God. Sing those. See, only when that music, the music of God, the music of the Holy Spirit is dancing in your heart, will you be able to say no to sin. And if you're ever wondering why you keep having the same problems and the same problems of sin, it's because the tempo and rhythm of the world fight against the spiritual growth 
in your heart. See, life is war. If you coast, you die. And what needs to happen most to you is that the beauty of God needs to come alive in your heart. The song needs to come alive. The psalmist, David, wrote in Psalm 22.1. He starts off with this, and it's so amazing. He says in Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he says that, and that's just the beginning of that verse. He goes on to, to say more. It's a long psalm. But he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what he's saying here is something that we know are words that Jesus Christ said. And if you read through Psalm 22, as David writes it, this is the song of abandonment. Jesus was forsaken by God on the cross of Calvary. But if you continue to read all the way down through Psalm 22, what you come to in the end, Psalm 22, verse 22, where David says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. And what we see here is that it started with the song of abandonment, but ended up with the song of praise. And what we find is Jesus, because he sang the song of abandonment for you and for me, we can sing the song of rejoicing to our God. That's what he's trying to help us understand here. So you want to know where to start in this battle? Where do we declare war? It's in the heart. That's where. You want to know how the power of sin is going to get broken in your life so that you don't have to keep living a less than life? It's when you realize that your sin cursed us and caused Jesus to sing the song of abandonment for you, for me. Start there. See, when I hear the song of abandonment, it puts a new song in my heart, a song of praise for the God who redeemed me. Receive what he did for you, what he did in your place, and the power of God will come alive within your heart. For Christ followers, let me just say this. Worship is a choice. Worship is a choice. And only by delighting in Christ can you drive out the affections for sin? That's the only way. Think often of the goodness of God. We have to, bottom line, declare war. Have you?